so the next topic we're going to talk about, it's an article in National Review. It touches on an idea that Milton Friedman talked about a long time ago, which is that college loans should be done through equity instead of debt. So you don't understand what that means. Basically, it means that instead of handing people a big pile of money and saying, here, go to a, get a college degree, they hand people and then pay us back with interest. They hand people a pile of money and then say, we will get X percentage of your earnings for the rest of your life or for X amount of time to pay off this degree. What do you think about that idea? Uh, there's an important caveat about this idea. Because, yeah, you linked something from National Review. I had to kind of research it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I found this article in Forbes, an old article here. I'll, I'll put it in the document. Well, is it specifically um, about what the National Review writes, though? Well, it's Maybe about... because Well, Milton Friedman came up with this idea in 1955, so yeah. the idea's been around for a long time. But one of the important things that I don't know... I don't remember if this National Review... It was a really short article. I don't think it mentioned, but in the paper, Friedman said that this idea only makes sense if it was the only form of government financing. Oh, right. They couldn't offer you... The other type. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Because so everybody would choose the other type. Yeah. So one thought I had about this is this sort of exists today a little bit in the form of these tech schools that you can go to, right? Like if you wanted to be, if you wanted to become like a JavaScript developer or like a web programmer or something, you could go to one of these tech schools right now probably for free, right? But then... And then they'll, in return, or maybe for some low, you know, low fee, and then in return, they, or also in these schools, they'll, they'll train you, and they offer to help you, you know, find a job. And then in return, you know, you have to pay them probably some percentage of your salary for who knows how long. Mm -hmm. So it kind of exists already, but obviously not near the form that Friedman was was thinking of it definitely seems like a better idea right it seems like a strictly better idea it seems um, like it's actually introducing market pressures into these decisions which uh, yes, is right along like, milton freeman's you know his wheelhouse yeah but i feel like not enough pressure <laughs> not enough well how about if you get government it, out of it i mean that's why i say it's strictly better than the current plan because i yeah. don't think it there's any access that you can really say it's worse, but perhaps it's still... I, I, could, maybe, I could make leftist arguments on how it's worse, but continue. Okay. But maybe you'd have to read the paper to see exactly you know, what more of the details are, because it still doesn't seem fully complete. Like, for example, could I... This is not for the know, government to finance, though. He's, he's thinking about private investors financing. Sure. Okay, yeah. yeah. If, if it was, if it was, yeah, whether it be private or government. So could I apply for this program, get accepted, go to school, and then after I go to school, I'll work for McDonald's for, you know, or maybe I have a hard time getting a job, so I work at McDonald's, and then... Yes. And, if the government know, was handing out these loans, they would, they, they would probably allow that. And that's where it would fall apart, because the government would just be okay giving out... But what okay printing money. Let's say you were a private uh, company handing out this loan. Like, what, what would you put in the, you know, in the agreement? That you couldn't you put. Know, you couldn't put. You couldn't put anything in the agreement. I don't think you can force people to work a good job. Exactly. It, it would just be. It would just. You'd be an insurance company. You just need. You would just need good actuarials to determine how much money yeah. you should give to certain types of people to get what kind of degree, whether it's yeah. profitable for you. And whenever, whenever it's a, a, a private individual or entity that has to make decisions that mean making a profit or losing money, they make really good quality decisions, generally, because money is on the line. The government doesn't make good quality decisions because they just hand out money. We know right now they just hand out these... They just hand out money for people to get bullshit degrees. But if we adopted a program like this... It would cut down immensely 
on the number yeah. of people who get bullshit degrees because you know what you don't make any money off these bullshit degrees so nobody's gonna give you the money to get those degrees i'm just i'm a i'm just like the the main issue i see with this you know which it, the problem that it doesn't seem to solve it incentivizes the uh companies you know to make better decisions but how does it incentivize the individual really you know like there's nothing really to incentivize that that per, the person who gets the well um, the loan it incentivizes them it incentivizes them by limiting the number of options they have and eliminating some of the dumb choices that they might have taken right yeah like, yeah. I mean, like but, but you could yeah you could go to school and then waste it i, I think is what i'm saying yes right? like, yes but then uh, then you're talk, just talking about the actuarials you're just talking about determining what percentage of people get a good degree let's say a stem degree and still don't make much money that's just yeah. up to the actuarials to determine it's part of the risk profile right but it it, it incentivizes good behavior and good decision making the same way strict mortgage lending incentivizes good behavior it does yeah. it by just limiting <laughs> the, the amount of choices you have so that you can't do dumb things like take out a million dollar mortgage that you can't afford you know, right. you just can't do it, so you don't right. do it. Which, which is probably what you're going to say. The left would have a problem with, right? Because they, they would they have want... a, their argument. They... And I can tell you exactly what their argument would be. Yeah. If you have a world like this, where banks, private entities invest in people, they're only going to invest, of course, a STEM. You know, whatever's valuable, right? Uh, things that actually produce people who make money. But the left will argue that, well, you don't need just people who make money in this world to make it go around. And I would, I would agree with them. I would say, like, mm -hmm. you can't just have engineers in this world. That's not going to be a very functional world. You need, art, you need artists. You need filmmakers. That's true, okay? You even need a couple psych majors. Not the millions that we have right now, but you still need some. You may even need some gender studies majors, okay? right maybe <laughs> maybe the country can have five or six at any given time okay <laughs> but the left would argue that the only people who get these majors are rich people because they can afford to just get a, a thing that's a, a degree that's not going to be too profitable and also still pay you know the tuition okay so, so then the way the way this might work out though is that um the schools that are offering art degrees and so forth will will charge less <laughs> maybe i mean possibly I would, yeah we don't, we don't know exactly how that would shake out but yeah. i can tell you that the immediate argument the left would make is that this creates a world where only rich people can get a certain number of variety of degrees and poor people are limited to this selection and that's unfair to the poor people even though i would argue it's um awesome for poor people because what this means is that people who are poor uh, get good degrees that will mean that they make a lot of money in the future and the uh, the children of rich people can further away their family's fortunes by getting a gender studies degree and now their family uh, generational wealth can go down which it deserves to go down because you're an idiot who got a gender studies degree right and the poor poor person's kid who was forced to get an engineering degree now their family well a generational wealth goes up which hey isn't that a more equal society isn't that what hey left isn't that not what you're trying to get this would achieve that why 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 don't we let the children of rich people have more avenues for them to waste it away and why don't we limit the children of poor people to things that are gonna help them make money and be productive in the future i think that's a, actually a good world but see they are just concerned about choice and flexibility and stuff like that so which is it but that's the argument they would make it's a bs argument in my mind you know <clears throat> but that's like that's like it's like arguing for the right for people to take on bad mortgages in my opinion yeah. why should we why should we allow you to take on bad mortgages there are things that we should protect you from and taking on a bad mortgage is one of those things that i, I think that we should protect you from and equally Wait, it's not just it's not just bad mortgages it's also borrowers bad bad borrowers yes people handing out bad mortgages and people taking on or, yeah both yeah. 
So the schools handing out, and I view gender studies degrees the same way. So the schools are culpable in handing out a garbage degree that's worth nothing, but then charging twenty, thirty thousand dollars for it. And the consumer is culpable for taking on this bad deal and buying this product <laughs> is worthless for twenty or thirty thousand dollars a year. So both are making a super bad decision. Now, you can say, well, isn't this very anti-free market of you? to limit people's choice no because if you can come up with the money you're still free to get this worthless gender studies degree go ahead have at it go crazy okay but you need to come up with the thirty thousand dollars a year to get this degree the taxpayer is not going to come up with it for you and um uh, citibank is not going to come up with it for you you need to come up with it go ahead and find a way to pay thirty thousand dollars in cash for this stupid degree that you want if you're really that dead set on it so the free market is still well in effect healthy the option is there for you but we're not going to put into place lend borrowing and lending systems that enable your shitty choices and enable the creation of more worthless gender studies majors okay we are not going to do know, that i i put something like art way 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 above i mean Gender studies or, or psychology. What? Like uh, like music or art, you know, that kind of... I'm not oh. talking about art history. Oh, yeah. So things that don't suck like those things do. I, I'm, I'm saying like these are, these are still productive skills, right? Like if you go to art school... They are. They you are. You learn about design. But I think, um, that, I think that if, they're, if they can be shown to be monetarily productive, and I think that yeah. you, can, you can establish that music can be monetarily productive yeah so you will find people who can invest in you who are willing to yeah. invest in you i think that if you show that you have an aptitude for music you'll find citibank will pay for your tuition to juilliard yeah like, it's not like the people who graduate from juilliard go on to make uh they don't go on to work at starbucks okay a lot of them <laughs> go on to have very lucrative careers and stuff right <laughs> yeah i think that to say the least yeah yeah so well the actuarials at Citibank will say, well, a person who is, is talented in music and wants a, us to pay for them to go to Juilliard or music school or whatever, they're not a bad investment. And here's how much money we'll give you. And here's how much percentage we'll take from your earnings in the future. There, go have at it. Does it feel like the, the internet and social media have kind of made these kind of art degrees much more valuable than before? I don't know. I think so, just because there's more media out there in general, mm -hmm. and people consume more media. So you know, you'll have more people who need it to do music and any kind of media, even you know, like website design or digital design or anything like that. You'll need more of these, pe these people. Yeah. But that means that there are jobs out there, real, real jobs with pretty good income, pretty good uh, futures, where somebody will want to invest in your education. But a, a system where an equity system of financing, like Milton Freeman wants is, uh, <laughs> or suggested, will cut out a lot of these total BS. Like, we don't need this many psych majors. We don't need this many ethnic studies or gender studies majors. Because you know what? They go on to do nothing. Even the ones, maybe there are a couple who go on to do something and make some money, but there's only so many of them. And They're all the, at uh, New York Times. Right. There's only, but there's only so many jobs at the New York Times, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know? And this will all be factored in to the, to the numbers when Citibank decides whether or not to loan you X amount of money to go to school and get this degree. They're going to factor that in. And if they tell you that this is just a... They're not going to give you the money for it, that's tough. Nobody's telling you you can't get the degree. You just have to come up with the money yourself. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Does it mean that now uh, people who have money, whose parents have money, they have more options? Yes. But you know what? We live in a world where people with money have more options than people without money. And that's, that's just the reality of it. We're not going to get out of a world like that. And this is one of the, the, the places where limiting those options are actually probably even good for people. Yeah, they're, doing mean, you I, a, they're doing you a favor, not, let, not giving you the money to get this stupid degree. It's clear that the current system, the cons are, you know, enormous. <laughs> it's, 
it's led to just massive, massive amounts right. of waste, right? And, it's just yeah, and all these people who say, "Oh, I'm crushed by student debt." Well, there would be fewer people who say that, right? The student debt is part is partially because <laughs> the prices are so high because the money has been so easy. Yeah, so it's like yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's not even yeah. We haven't even touched on why are prices so high in college. The government has been handing out money like candy for people to go to school. And so, of course, these schools are just going to raise the price. I made this analogy in a previous episode where if, if the government handed you $10,000 a year under the stipulation that you could only spend it on food at McDonald's, what's going to happen to prices at McDonald's? They're going to skyrocket because they know you've got all this free money from the government to spend on McDonald's. And you can only spend it there. You can't go buy a car or something with it. Man, I, I wouldn't be able to afford going to McDonald's. <laughs> no, and the, what would happen to the prices? And then, and then everybody would have their McDonald's, crushed by their McDonald's debt because of all this <laughs> money that's spent on McDonald's from 18 to 22. And then they would lament the fact that they even went to McDonald's in the first place. It's like, why did I borrow all this money to buy $50 Big Macs? This was a terrible decision. Well, you were 18. You make some terrible decisions at 18. And... Uh. If we had a system more like this, then you wouldn't even have those terrible options to choose from. You still would want to go to college, but you would be forced to choose something practical, pragmatic. You would be forced by Citibank to choose a major that's actually productive. And then once you got out of school, you would most likely make good money, pay back your loan, not feel crushed by student debt, not have to have Joe Biden bail you out, right? That's what would that's that's what would happen. And the only slight con is that maybe some people who grew up in poor families couldn't get some of these these BS degrees. But perhaps they would have been well suited to them or they wanted them. Well, you can't always get what you want. And definitely not. <laughs> sometimes life is unfair. Maybe you were perfect for that gender studies degree, but your parents just didn't have the money to fritter it away on on it oh well too bad right that's that's super unfortunate i mean there's other instances where you could say the same perhaps there's some ch there's some child no not even perhaps i'm almost certain of it there's some child out there in the inner city who grew up poor who, who if given the chance would be the best downhill skier on the planet the best but we'll never know and we'll never see that kid become that downhill skier. You know why? Because their family isn't fucking rich enough to go skiing all the time. <laughs> so that kid will never know that they have an aptitude for skiing. That kid will never even ski. So we'll never know. So who do we get as our skiers and our Olympic team and stuff? Kids from families who can afford to go skiing, of course. Duh. I can live with that. That's fine. That's fine. It's, it, I guess you could say maybe it's unfortunate that this person who otherwise might have been an awesome skier just was never exposed to it because the limitation was money. But I'm okay with that sacrifice if it means a more logical, more pragmatic, more r sensible system of lending out money for education. Especially because the uh, you know, technology, that's just what it does over time, right? It sort of levels the, the playing field it, or it makes things, increases accessibility. So yeah. it, even something like skiing, you know, it'll be more accessible uh, in the future where everybody's got self-driving cars. Yeah, so perhaps, I, perhaps yeah. maybe skiing will be more accessible. You know, a lot of these things will not be more accessible. Like golf is never that accessible. It's always expensive. And so... Yeah, some some things you're just going to be limited. You if you grew up in a poor family, you're just not going to have access to them. You'll never know if you had an aptitude for it. Even if you have Actually, an aptitude for it, maybe you maybe you will never be able to do it. Why do you say that golf was not accessible? It's very expensive to play golf. Uh, what are what what are the expenses? That well, a, a golf set costs several hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. A round of golf, even on a municipal course. I think it's like at least thirty dollars still now. Hmm. You know, every mm -hmm. single time you want to play, and you have to play. You can't just hit at a driving range. Mm -hmm. You have to actually play golf on a course. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that's accessible to people that come from poor families. 
Right, right. Yeah. Well, the, the clubs are probably uh, surmountable, but... Yeah, the, it's a uh, one-time cost. But yeah. the, the, each time you go play on a course, that repeated cost is pretty pricey. If, mm -hmm. if your family, you know, is like barely making ends meet, of course. Yeah. I'm just thinking in the future, you'll be, you would probably be able to just do it all virtually or something. If you could, sure. Yeah. Sure. But it seems like a hard thing to just do virtually. Like the club has to hit the ball, you know? And even, <laughs> you know, you know those simulators where you like hit a ball and it hits a wall and they say, oh, yeah, the, yeah. the ball went here, whatever. It's like, but you yeah. don't really know where the ball, you really have to have an actual ball cut through the wind and hit actual grass to really I... get it. You don't think so? Yeah. I think you do. I feel like all you need is, is uh, you don't even need the, the wall. I mean, you need the wall for practical purposes, but you probably just need video, right? You think so the video, maybe. All you need is a video of the shot. And then after that, all the physics can be calculated. The wind can be simulated, you know, and... Um, okay, okay, okay. But even this technology at the moment sounds super expensive. <laughs> probably. Right. <laughs> I was just trying to, I was just trying to, talk through whether or not this was an exception to you know my understanding that technology seems to increase accessibility no i agree with you there there is a far off future potentially where the technology to sort of capture your swing and know exactly where the ball would have gone in x conditions in this wind on this course yep. it can just sort of tell you what would have happened i think that that technology could exist for sure it doesn't even sound that complicated it's just it's, it would be expensive right now because there's not a lot of it. But yeah. if, as soon as you make something, of course, it gets cheaper as you do it more. It gets you know iteration and it gets more widespread. So things I mean, get it cheaper. Seems, it seems like with every single like I don't know. I feel like everything that I can think of, it's just all become more and more accessible. Probably right? like, like when I was a kid, I feel like even certain food was maybe harder to find, and now you know. Right, it's easier to get even, now. Yeah, even uh, you have you have friends who are, um, let's just say, on the on the poor side, but they have also had many fine, <laughs> fine meals. I would say. I don't know if that's right. If that's so, it's more accessible. More... Stuff gets more accessible, but at the same time, at any given time, it's safe to say that there are some things that probably rich people have access to and poor people won't. Right, and or whatever about, that thing like, is. Uh, Whatever that thing is, poor people won't have access to it. Yeah. Like, how about like cashmere sweaters, for example? Take another one. Oh, because um, there, there's, there's crappy cashmere now. Yeah, I feel like if you go back 20 years, uh, you may have to go back even a little bit more than 20 years. But uh, yeah, let's say if you go back 20 years, cashmere was not as accessible. Whereas nowadays, it feels much, much more common. Yeah, Even as you said, the quality of it may not the quality, be. As... Yeah, because they're kind of stretching the definition of cashmere now. <laughs> and a lot of garments have the blend. Yeah, where it's yeah. like, well, five percent of it, five <laughs> percent of it is cashmere. Yeah, a lot of things will become more affordable and more accessible, but there will always be some things. Some things will not be accessible to poor people. It's not fair necessarily. How, how, but... how hard is it to get? What is it? I think you had uh, that fatty duck liver or something. Is a uh... Foie gras. Yeah, yeah. How hard uh, is that is, to get? Yeah, how hard it's is that? Still pretty to get? expensive. Yeah, yeah, that's still pretty expensive. But you can go buy it. Where you can go to Whole. Can... I think I think they sell it at Whole Foods. Do they? Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well... <laughs> but generally, you get it at fine restaurants. Mm -hmm. It's really good too. I know you've never surprisingly yeah. you've never had it. I've never had it. Why? I'm not that adventurous when it comes to food. I, I think you should be. Nor, nor is my palate. Uh... <laughs> that refined yeah i don't understand i love five guys fries <laughs> well five guys makes excellent fries there's no denying it <laughs> oh, that's that's just, not evidence just, of an unrefined palate it's just good <laughs> but you should try foie gras for sure uh -huh. the way i would describe it is it's very umami it tastes very like meaty right you get that mm -hmm. flavor um and fatty because it's it's a fatty liver is it something that you could only but, really just have a little bit? Yes, it's so rich. Mm -hmm. It's extremely rich, like butter. Mm -hmm. But here's the difference between foie gras and other things that are just rich and fatty and very umami flavored. The difference is it doesn't leave this, that slick, gross, 
aftertaste of fat. Like if you consume too much fat, usually after a little bit, you just think, oh, I've got this gross mm. aftertaste and it just feels like too much. Whereas when you eat foie gras, kind of like it gives you that punch of flavor and it's very mm. intense and you mm-hmm. taste the richness. But then as soon as you swallow it, it's almost as if it goes away. If you drank mm-hmm. some water afterwards, it would just reset your palate very mm-hmm. successfully. So it's super rich without being cloying and gross after I mean, that might be similar to just like, um, you know, those fatty steaks, right? Like the Japanese, like the Kobe or Wagyu. Yes, I would say it's similar because the fat in those cuts or that type of beef, it's not like when you eat a poor quality of beef, but you just eat a hunk of the fat. In those situations, it kind of just sticks in your mouth and it's just has this aftertaste and you just can't get, r- get rid of it. And it's actually it gross after a while. Yeah. But you don't get that sensation with foie gras or with, or with beef that's just impeccably marbled with fat. Yeah. You know, as you would know, because you've eaten that in Japan, correct? Uh, have I? Have um... you? It's beef. It's well within your... Limited yeah, yeah. But knowledge. I don't think I've had I've had that in Japan. I've had it here, but not in Japan. Oh, uh, okay. Well, now you got to go to Japan and eat it. Why the, did you eat it while you were there? Yeah, the thing that I loved in Japan actually was... <laughs> actually, my probably my top three favorite things in Japan. None of them are anywhere expensive. Interesting. Versus, like, the most expensive thing I had in Japan, or the uh, most prestigious thing, I guess you could say. I think I went to a... I think it was a two-star place that sold a tempura mm-hmm. and yeah. you know it was good but two star I, uh, two star on yelp what do you mean two star do you mean two Mich- two michelin star or whatever is it is it out of two? three stars like it is yeah so it was a two but it wasn't expensive star. it just had two michelin stars it was expensive oh i don't remember exactly how expensive it was maybe it was three michelin star i don't know it was one of these highly rated places so what are you talking um, about when you said like cheap things <laughs> No, no, no. I'm saying I wasn't so impressed by that. Oh, okay. Yeah. And the things I actually liked are uh, this cheap curry restaurant and cheap sushi at one of these. Almost like it wasn't like a sushi boat, but pretty much along those lines. We ordered, it was like the two or three dollar sashimi. I can't remember. I think it was, it was probably... You know, it was probably, they had different, um, you know, there was like the medium fatty tuna or the really fatty tuna. But these were like two or three dollars uh, a serving. And we ordered like, I don't know, five or six of them because they were so good. <laughs> and then the uh, pork buns, which were also cheap. Which were also funny enough, you know, they're not necessarily, quote, Japanese, right? It's like they're, no. it's, it's a Japanese take on a Chinese food. Right. Or a Chinese dish, but the way that these these uh, it was a chain again. The way that this chain does it, it was amazing, <laughs> and they're cheap pork buns. So those are the things I miss the most: True. the cheap sushi, the the curry, and the uh, pork buns. Well, yeah, I, I, I've the only expensive it. the only expensive, expensive places, thing I miss. They're not always the best. Yeah, the only expensive thing I miss from Japan is the fruit. But although, again, even even for the cheap fruit there. It can be really good. I had, it was like, like a cheap uh, strawberry smoothie from a place that's, you know, maybe similar to a 7-Eleven type of store. And it was the best strawberry smoothie I've had yeah, in my life, I would say. It was just the, the, it had that intense strawberry flavor to it. It was amazing. <laughs>